Good evening, everyone, and happy Donate Life Month. Uh, what a month of all kinds of exciting activities going on here for Donate Life Month. If you're like me, uh, you participated uh, in the virtual donor dash this year. It was my sixth year uh, honoring my donor, James, in the Gift of Life um, virtual donor dash. So since it was virtual, I did something a little different this year because usually we're at the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum and uh, we're running up Kelly Drive and uh, the past two years we haven't been able to do that. So knowing that my donor grew up in Wall Township, New Jersey, I thought I would take the dash to uh, one of his hometowns. So I went with my fiance to Spring Lake, New Jersey, and we actually walked a 7K, and um, we started in Spring Lake. We uh, walked through Belmar um, and Avon by the sea, so we got to take in the beautiful weather at the beach, uh, something that my donor James enjoyed. He uh, loved the sun. He loved the beach, uh, so I thought it would be a great way to honor him, and of course, my sponsors this year were my donor's family. Uh, so it was great to have them involved. Uh, they look forward to uh, the 25th anniversary of the Dash in person next year in Philadelphia. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to make that uh, happen. Uh, so I want to welcome our new viewers tonight and uh, also uh, our new members. Of course, uh, we have a special membership if you get the newsletter. And I do have some special trio masks still available. If you send in your money for your yearly membership, uh, you'll get one of these exciting trio Philadelphia masks. Carlo, I may have an extra one since you're a guest speaker for us tonight. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> I, I know you were wondering, so I thought I'd let you know. Uh, so next month, uh, we do have another great meeting. We're going to have a summer primer on skin cancer and protection. In our main meeting, we'll have two nurse practitioners uh, joining us from Penn Medicine. Up, uh, I, um, this is just in, I subscribed to a email um, blast of things that are happening breaking news stories in the uh, medical uh, field. And I see here that um, a man just had an accident while playing peekaboo. He's currently in the ICU. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so it's an honor and a privilege uh, to welcome our guest speaker tonight. Uh, as most of you know, I, I certainly brag about this a lot, but uh, we have our um, guest tonight is my surgeon that procured my life-saving heart and was part of my team. Um, you know, we certainly met just hours after um, my new life started, and uh, we've remained in touch ever since. Uh, gosh, he's just a great guy. He's been all over Penn. He's been all over CHOP. And now he's going to be all over Geisinger. He just took a position uh, in Danville, PA. Uh, so he'll still be close to home. Um, but with that, I'd like to introduce Carlo Bartoli. Carlo, thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, hey Bill, how are you? All righty. <laughs> I so, like your bike back there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bruce, thanks for joining us. Um, so... Carlo, we can have you uh, share screen if you know how to do that. Yes, I'll go ahead and do that now. Okay. Uh, I will tell you uh, during Carlo's presentation, if you have any questions, you can certainly type them in the chat as you're thinking about it, but uh, he should have some time at the end uh, to answer any questions. So we have a really interesting topic tonight, something that I've never seen or um, was able to talk about until now, and Carlo graciously agreed uh, to do this. So while we're on the table waiting for our life-saving gift, what is actually happening 
at the procurement hospital. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn everything over to Carlo. Great, thank you, Bill. Can you see the slides and can you? Yes, yep. Excellent. Bill, thank you for inviting, uh, inviting me to do this. I've known Bill for just about six years now. Um, he's one of my best patients. He's certainly a dear friend. Um, one of the things Bill didn't mention, in addition to my clinical cardiac surgery practice, I run a translational biophysics laboratory. Uh, and so I give frequent talks about pretty heavy duty mechanistic biology and bioengineering. And so it, it's really a nice change of pace for me to be invited to give a talk about a different topic uh, that is close to the heart. I see what you did there. I have no relevant financial disclosures. But I will be talking about removing organs from one human and putting them into another. And so some of the discussion will be graphic. Some of the images uh, and videos that I show will also be graphic. I'll give fair warning before I show images or videos from the operating room. Um, but as difficult as some of this may be to hear and to see, I think the content of my talk contains a special beauty and certain perspective on the gift of life. Brief overview of my talk. I'll start by talking about the process of organ evaluation. Really what happens when we receive that initial phone call that there is a brain dead donor with an organ that's available for transplant. I'll talk about travel to the procurement site, how we prepare the donor, and the moment of silence, which is uh, very important to me. I'll talk a little bit about intraoperative organ evaluation and ultimately how we make the decision to either accept or turn down a donor organ. Talk a little bit about surgical removal and preservation of the donor organs for transport, and then travel back to the implant site. Some of you on this call are organ recipients, and so I'm hoping that within this context, it may become more clear why you, have, uh, you may have experienced long de delays. Some of you may have experienced dry runs where you came into the hospital expecting to receive an organ, and then the organ was turned down uh, and you left without a transplant. And then also why timing is so important in organ transplantation. And then finally, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. At any time, day or night, um, we may receive a phone call with uh, an offer for a donor organ. And so the evaluation process includes uh, a lot of data that we look at. There's a face sheet. Um, at this point, the organ has already been matched with a specific recipient on the waiting list, the blood type, um, and based on their blood type, the level of sickness and the time on the waiting list. And so really the purpose of the call is for us to evaluate the quality of the organ. And so the first thing that we learn about is the uh, mechanism of donor brain death. And these are always sad stories. Um, in this particular situation, the mechanism of brain death was drug intoxication. Um, drug overdose is now the most common uh, source of donor organs, the opioid pandemic um, has created um, many, uh, many individuals who go down this pathway, end up overdosing, are found brain dead, uh, resuscitated, and, and then are, um, are donors for organs. I've also uh, procured organs from patients that had uh, physical trauma. Usually it's a motor vehicle accident or a uh, motorcycle accident. Sadly, uh, I've had the unfortunate 
circumstance where I procured um, organs from patients that had committed suicide. Uh, I procured a heart from a 14 year old boy who hanged himself from a tree out front of his high school so that when his classmates uh, ended their school day, they would walk out and they would see him. Uh, I procured another heart from a 12 year old boy who hanged himself after arguing with his father about having a cell phone at 12 years old. The father thought that it was inappropriate. The boy wanted the phone. And in order to punish the father, he hanged himself. Um, stroke is a less frequent um, source of donor organs. And then uh, finally, also rarely homicide. Uh, I, I procured uh, an organ from a 34 year old woman who was executed with a gunshot to the head. And so um, these are very sad stories. It's always uh, a sad story. In addition to the mechanism of donor brain death, we look very carefully at a number of data points. We look at the uh, patient vital signs to see what the stability of the patient has been. We look at lab laboratory values um, to see if any of the organs are developing dysfunction or even failure. We do a urinalysis, arterial blood gases to look at the levels of oxygenation. This is especially important when procuring lungs for lung transplant to make sure that the lungs are able to exchange gas and will work when we transplant them. We look at cardiac enzymes. So these are a marker of cardiac injury. This is especially important if CPR was performed during the resuscitation of the patient, and there may have been some cardiac injury. Um, we also look at uh, cultures and microbiology uh, in order to know if there are any infections brewing, and then a profile of infectious diseases. Uh, what we don't want to do is transplant an organ that would pass on an infectious disease to the recipient. There's also a variety of imaging, which gives us information about the size and the function of the organ. This is especially important for heart and lung transplantation. So taken all together, um, this gives us some sort of indication of the quality of the organ, which we next consider in the context of our potential recipient, our patient. And so it's already been established that they have a compatible blood type, that's a match. We then consider the severity of sickness um, or the urgency of, of the transplant for the recipient. Is the patient at home doing well or is the patient in the ICU sick on a ventilator, maybe on artificial circulation? Um, they may not even live long enough to see the next compatible donor organ offer. We consider the size of the organ. This is especially important for lung transplantation. This is a common source of dry runs for lung recipients. Um, we'll go out to uh, evaluate a quality organ and uh, we find out that the size of the chest is very different from the recipient. And so sometimes in those situations, um, we're not willing to accept an organ that's not gonna fit. And so we'll turn it down and it'll go to uh, a different center. Distance of recipient from the hospital sometimes comes into play. Um, if a potential recipient lives far from the hospital and will need to travel a number of hours, we have to take that into consideration for the timing and that doesn't always uh, work out. And importantly, the distance of the donor from the transplant hospital. So as soon as we arrest the circulation of the donor and remove the, the organ from the donor. What's called the ischemic time starts. And so this is a clock that we abide by very carefully, um, which allows us to safely transplant the organ. And for different organs, you have a different um, length of ischemic time that's safe. In general, for hearts, uh, the heart can only be outside of the body for four hours before it needs to be put in 
uh, to the recipient. Four and a half hours, probably okay. Five hours, probably okay. Once you get into the five and a half to six hours, then you're starting to play Russian roulette. And so we really don't like going that long. Um, it makes the chance of the heart restarting and functioning well, much lower. Lungs, um, we have a little bit longer of an ischemic time, maybe up to eight to 10 hours, but we like to minimize that. And then for uh, livers and kidneys, also a little bit longer. Kidneys can go up to 24 hours, uh, but there's a caveat. There's a device that's been developed um, where the organ is placed inside of a cooler and it's attached basically to a pump that flows a solution through it that's like blood, which prolongs the ischemic time, allows uh, the organ um, to, to survive and to function uh, for a longer period of time until it is implanted into the recipient. So once we deem an organ high quality, or if the recipient is so sick um, that we decide to take a chance on an organ of marginal quality because we don't think that uh, the recipient will live long enough for another offer, uh, we travel to the procurement site to evaluate the organ. If it's nearby, so somewhere in the region, we take the helicopter. And if it's further away, we take the Learjet. The furthest uh, from Philadelphia that I've gone, the furthest south is Central Florida. I went down there for a set of lungs. Um, the furthest west that I've gone from Philadelphia is Western Ohio. We went there for uh, a heart. And then these are some of the members uh, of our transplant team. I think it's always important to pay homage to your mentors. This is uh, Yoshi Suzuki. He is the procurement surgeon and a heart surgeon at Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So he trained me, he taught me uh, how to procure uh, hearts and lungs for transplantation. Um, interestingly, I also want to mention his son, uh, Genzi Suzuki is on the US men's uh, Olympic gymnastics team. And so if the Olympics are allowed to happen uh, this year in Japan, he will be competing in the Olympics this summer. At the procurement site, we do three verifications. So these are very important. The first verification is the donor blood type. We want to make sure that the blood types are compatible. Accidentally transplanting an organ of an incompatible blood type will potentially kill a patient in a matter of hours. And so this is something we're very careful about uh, documenting and confirming. Number two, we make sure that we have the appropriate consent either from the donor or the donor's family. Without consent, operating on someone is assault and ending someone's life uh, is homicide. And so this is something we take very seriously, having appropriate consents. And then number three, proof of brain death. Most states require two separate neurologists to perform what's called a brain death exam, which is a battery of tests that demonstrate medically, physiologically, and also legally that the patient is brain dead. And so without any one of these three verifications, we will not proceed um, with the, the organ procurement. And actually about three or four years ago, I was um, procuring a, a heart in Akron General Hospital. It's a hospital that LeBron James was born in. And, um, by accident, someone from one of the teams had faxed along information from two different donors. And so in this situation, we couldn't tell who we had information from. And so this was a hard stop. Everyone took it very seriously. We wanted to make sure that we went through um, the process of having the appropriate verifications, making sure that all of the information was appropriate and correct. 
Um, and, and ultimately we were able to reconcile which donor uh, was which and we proceeded. Um, but this is something that we take very seriously. This also is another reason why um, there are potentially delays. When you were waiting for your transplant, um, it may have been a few hours, it may have been many hours. And it's because there are a lot of checkpoints that are put into place um, to make sure that everything is done perfectly so that everyone is protected and the recipient of the organ does well. Next, um, preparation of the donor and the moment of silence. So once we've received the three verifications, the family says their final goodbyes, uh, typically in the ICU. The donor is then wheeled from the ICU to the operating room. We do a sterile prep and uh, draping of the donor, scrub for surgery. And then at this point, there's a reading uh, about the donor. So this is typically written by family and friends, who the donor was, their family, their gifts, their goals, their givings. And this is a special moment to hear about who this person is. This is followed by a moment of silence. This is a profound moment. In some ways, it's similar to a wedding or a funeral or the birth of a new child. Uh, I've been in this moment almost 70 times. And every time it still sends a chill up my spine. There are four or five teams, usually about 20 to 25 people in the room who've come from across the country to this location, to this moment, to effectively end the life of an individual who is unfortunately brain dead, so that multiple others across the country may receive the gift of life. And so some of you on this call are organ recipients. Um, I think it's probably appropriate that we take a moment of silence now to honor those who succumbed so that each of you could be here with us today. Time to make the incision and start the procurement. When I am evaluating a heart, I will have already looked at the cardiac enzymes. I will have looked at the echocardiogram to get a sense for the heart function, the valve function, the thickness of the heart. Um, there's many different uh, details that I look at to ensure that it's a high quality heart. If there is coronary angiography available, um, which is uh, a procedure where dye is squirted down the coronary arteries. I'll take a look at these images to try and understand the coronary anatomy, look for any abnormalities, any blockages. Again, anything that would suggest to me that this is not a high quality heart that is gonna function well. I perform a sternotomy to enter the chest and examine the heart. So the next video will be graphic. This is uh, an adult heart that I procured in Boston. I look at um, a number of different things and perform a number of maneuvers to evaluate the anatomy, the valve function and integrity, coronary calcification, uh, I look for trauma, I look at overall function. Really, I'm looking for any reason not to accept the heart. This is a, another heart that I procured in central Pennsylvania. So I procured this heart from a four day old infant. This is arguably the absolute most valuable commodity that exists in our society. What price can you put on a four-day-old heart 
that has the potential to give a dying newborn an entire lifetime. Just wanted to let that idea sink in for a moment. So let's transition to the evaluation of lungs. It's a little bit of a different process. So I will have looked at the chest x-ray. I will have measured um, each hemithorax, so each chest field, uh, to understand whether the lungs, when we take them out, um, will potentially fit in the recipient that the lungs have been matched with. I take a look at the CT scan. CT scans give you a lot of information. So this is a CT scan um, from a patient who had uh, a motor vehicle accident, had trauma. And you can see on the right, the right lung field is totally normal. This is all normal. But on the left, there's this space that's black. So this is um, a pneumothorax. This is air inside of the chest cavity. And so as a result, that right lung uh, has collapsed. This doesn't mean necessarily that I would turn down these lungs, but it certainly is a cause for concern. And there are some maneuvers that I would have to do in order to reinflate the lung, and then certainly pay attention to the function of that lung in order to decide whether or not to accept um, these lungs for transplant. Another CT scan of the lung fields. So in this donor, there was this nodule. So this was concerning to see and something, certainly something that I needed to investigate further. Um, a nodule like this could be totally benign, but it could also potentially be a cancer. And so the last thing that we wanna do is procure organs um, from a patient that has cancer, transplant them into others and potentially lead to cancer in those recipients. And so in a situation like this, we performed a biopsy. It turned out that this was a benign lung nodule. But again, this is another potential source of a delay during the transplant process. This was a surprise and we needed to evaluate it and make sure that if we were going to accept these lungs, um, it would be safe. This is a very common CT scan that we see. This is another trauma patient. Um, in the right lung, so on the left side, and this is a chest tube that's been placed, which is common for trauma. And then the left lung, this whole area, this is a big pneumonia that's brewing in the left lower lobe. So this gives me great pause. Anytime I see something like this, I'm concerned the lungs are not only infected, but because of this pneumonia, the lungs probably aren't gonna work that well. And so ultimately I ended up turning down these lungs. But one of the things that I will do in a situation like this is bronchoscopy. So take a camera, look down the lung tree um, and see what's there. In this case, the lung tree was full of pus. Again, this was a raging pneumonia in this patient. If there's a small pneumonia, I can usually clean out the lung. There are some medicines that I can give. There's some maneuvers that I can do to try and improve uh, the quality and the function. And usually that works pretty well. And so we can salvage organs with a little pneumonia, but with the pneumonia that's raging like this, typically not. So next for lungs, sternotomy. And then I wanna see the lungs, I wanna feel them. This again is gonna be uh, graphic images. This is a uh, left and right lung from the same patient. I've hyperinflated them and then herniated the lungs out of the chest. So I do this in order to inspect them for general appearance, for trauma, any tumors, growths, any pulmonary emboli, which are clots and any anatomic abnormalities. Um, you may notice that these lungs are somewhat dark. In fact, there are black spots 
all over them. And so at first glance, one may think these lungs are no good. So this is actually a common finding. Anyone who's lived in a big city uh, or an urban environment with ambient air pollution for more than two to three decades probably has lungs that look similar to this, even though the lungs are totally normal. Um, there are cells in the lung that scavenge for particulate air pollution matter, and they basically sequester it, they package it away, and they store it, and it shows up these little black spots. Um, but really, the lungs are no worse for the wear. And actually, ultimately, I did end up accepting these lungs, and they did great. After evaluating the anatomy, maybe the most important thing is the arterial blood gases. So I will take measurements from each uh, pulmonary vein, so the vessel um, that comes out of the lungs in order to understand how well the lungs are exchanging gas, how well they deliver oxygen. And so if they meet a certain threshold, I designate them as high quality, that they're gonna function well, and then that'll be part of the decision whether or not to accept these for transplant. So the next step, number of phone calls. <clears throat> it's decision time. So I call the implanting surgeon who's back at my home hospital and we have a conversation about the donor, all the data um, that I've collected, about the recipient, what we know about the recipient and their status, about the urgency of the transplant. And based on all of these data, we make a decision whether or not to uh, accept or turn down the organ. If we turn down the organ, the organ is then offered to the next center and the patient that's next on the waiting list. This is not only another cause for delays, but also a cause uh, for dry runs. At this point, our recipient would have been waiting in the hospital for the green light. Turns out it's a red light. The organ is given to someone else. And now the process of allocating that organ starts over. If we decide to accept the organ, at that point, the recipient is put to sleep and the surgeons at the home hospital begin the process of opening the chest and removing the diseased organ. Timing, 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 very important. We do this in a way where we minimize the amount of time that the donor organ is outside of the body, the ischemic time. And we try and minimize the amount of time that the recipient is either on the heart-lung machine and the diseased organ is, in, is outside of their body. In parallel with this, all of the other teams that are in the room, so the liver team, the kidney team, heart, lung, if there's a pancreas team, if there's an intestine team, they're going through the same process of evaluating the imaging, evaluating the organ, calling back to their center, making sure the timing works out. And so again, these are some of the causes for delays. These are some of the causes for dry runs. Ultimately, when everyone's organ is prepared, all of the organs have been accepted or turned down. We perform what's called the cross clamp. You may have heard um, this phrase. Applying the cross clamp is really putting a clamp across the aorta and stopping the circulation. So at this point, the clock starts ticking. The heart team is the leader team. So the heart team controls the circulation. Um, because the heart is least resistant to ischemic time, the heart is also the first organ out because it needs to get into the recipient as quickly as possible. As soon as we cross clamp, we introduce what's called a plege solution. Uh, plege is Greek for paralysis. This is a cold high potassium solution that simultaneously arrests the function of the organ 
and preserves the organ. We then cut the organ out from the body. This is an example of a single lung on ice. You can see that this is much more pink than the previous example that I showed you. This is someone who lived out in the country. We package the organ on ice in a cooler. For lungs, sometimes we will package them what's called en bloc. So this is both lungs are still connected to the trachea. It's one blocked organ. That'll be a double lung transplant in one recipient. Sometimes we package them individually so the two lungs are separated. These may either go to the same recipient um, as a double lung transplant. Sometimes these will go separately to separate recipients who will each receive a single lung transplant. The heart is also packaged up on ice, placed in the cooler. And Bill, if you can join, um, take your mute off for a moment. I just wanted to uh, ask you, on what date was your uh, heart transplant? That was June 17th of 2015. So this is the cooler in which I transplanted Bill's heart. My donor, James Zimmerman Jr. That's right. So now it's go time. The clock is ticking. We have uh, about four hours to get back to the recipient, sew the heart in, and turn it on. And so you can tell from this image, we're in a hurry. It's a little bit blurry. You can see that the ambulance driver is ready with the door open so we can load up the heart, get in the ambulance, lights and sirens to the runway. Uh, we get on the jet or we get on the helicopter. and we travel back to the implant site. At the implant site, we land. I'll tell you a brief story about a, an international procurement uh, that I went on. This was my intern year. Uh, I flew to Toronto, Canada for a heart. I brought my passport so that I could re-enter the United States. The procurement was unremarkable. We landed at Philadelphia International Airport and unbeknownst to us, we had not filled out the appropriate customs forms. And so they would not let us back into the country, even though we had a heart on ice. And so for about 15 to 20 minutes uh, after pleading with the customs official and explaining that there's a patient about three and a half miles from here on the heart lung machine whose diseased heart has just been removed from their body and even showing the customs official the packaged heart on ice, we were allowed to fill out the appropriate paperwork and we were able to get back into the country and proceed to the hospital and transplant that patient. From the tarmac lights and sirens to the hospital and get to the hospital and sew the organ in. In short, that's organ procurement and the gift of life. And so again, Bill, I wanna thank you uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I wanna thank you for your leadership, for your charisma, for your courage, for being an ambassador to the transplant community. Uh, I also, for those who don't know, want to uh, mention that I think it was two, two summers ago, Bill went to the uh, transplant Olympics and he won four medals. So actually there's a photo here of one of the medals that he presented to me. So this is very special to me. I have it on my wall. I show it to just about everyone that I can. Uh, and it makes me so proud and it's also humbling um, to have been able to participate in Bill's transplant and then for him to do so well, go to the transplant games, win a medal, give it to me and now it's on my wall. Are there any questions? Wow, that was uh, certainly a very touching 
um, presentation for me especially uh, to share those pictures and uh, videos is just incredible. And it's always something that's in the back of every transplant recipient's mind of, you know, what's happening on the other side of things while we're in the operating room waiting for that gift. And, you know, I wanted to start with a question because you mentioned the teams that are procuring the different organs and all the people that are in the room. Uh, I heard that usually in the case of organs like the heart, for example, there may be three patients that are notified of a particular organ and are all set up in the event that one team waves it off, another team can take it. Can you talk to that a little bit in regards to um, the allocation of organs and how many patients are actually waiting? So that's correct. Anytime there's a donor offer, there's a primary recipient, and then there are secondary recipients that are next in line on the list. And so the secondary centers are notified as backups. Depending on the organ quality and depending on the organ type, meaning heart, lung, liver, kidneys, pancreas, intestines, et cetera, um, different surgeons have different strategies for how many recipients they'll call in. It's typical for lungs that multiple recipients will be called. And actually not infrequently in our center, two patients may be called in simultaneously, depending on the size of the lungs. And so the goal is to have the primary and if there's any reason why the lungs may not fit, may be concerns, may think that potentially that patient would do better with a different later offer, um, the decision may be made to go to the secondary recipient. And because they're already available, notified, potentially even in-house, it doesn't slow down the process. So that's from our side. From the recipient side, this is another cause for dry runs. You're called in, you think that you're gonna be getting an organ, there's a good chance that you will, but based on the process, based on the timing, based on, frankly, potential safety concerns, um, it may be in the best interest to not go with the primary recipient, go to the secondary recipient. And so these are some of the considerations that, that we make um, when we're making decisions uh, about accepting or turning down organs. Oh, can I just add something about that? When you have a backup person, that's, I mean, there's a list of priority and it's just coincidental that they happen to be the next one in line or do you have some prerogative to override the ranking because it's coming to your hospital and you have another patient? So there's sort of, there's sort of two answers to that. At, at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, we do such a high volume of lung transplants that many of the patients on the list are, are our patients. And so not infrequently, the next patient in terms of severity of, of, of sickness, in terms of length of waiting, in terms of compatibility is our patient. And sometimes it's multiple patients in a row. And so we have the benefit of knowing that if we turn it down for the primary, it's gonna be offered to the secondary who's also us. Okay. That's one situation. The other situation doesn't come up as often, but it has come up a few times. And this is more of a safety um, issue. Infrequently, an offer will be made. A team goes out and evaluates the organ. For whatever reason, it's decided that it'll be turned down uh, for the primary recipient. The secondary recipient is at a different center, okay? So now we need to make the decision, do we call in another transplant team who's gonna fly in from somewhere else? 
wait for them to arrive, wait for them to do the evaluation process. If the donor is stable, that's the right thing to do. That's how the waiting list works. Rarely the donor isn't that stable. They've been open for a few hours. Everyone's done their evaluations. Everyone's ready to proceed with the procurement. And so the chances of that donor remaining stable until that team arrives are low. And so in a situation like that, a decision may be made. We'll make an offer to, the, to a patient from the center that turned it down because it's in the best interest um, of the donor and it's in the best interest of all of the other recipients whose organs are now waiting for that decision to be made. Uh, who makes that decision? Does that go back to UNOS? Because they're the ones that have the list that was generated, right? That does go back to UNOS. That's correct. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. I've only run into that situation, I, I think, twice. You know, and, and it's a difficult decision to make because you're weighing, um, you're weighing the list and the rules against the safety of all of those other organs that are waiting to be taken out. And so, you know, if we wait too long and the patient becomes unstable and <laughs> isn't made for that organ, and God forbid the donor becomes so unstable that they pass, now all of the organs are lost. So this is another, you know, another challenge. These are some of the challenges that we have to deal with. And, you know, there, there, there are rules, there are ethics, and then there's also the safety component. And so we have to try and take these into consideration and, and do right by everyone involved, all of the stakeholders. And there are many stakeholders in this process um, in order to make sure that, that quality organs are received by the appropriate people and ultimately the patients do well. Tom, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? Yeah, doctor. Um, my name's Tom Jean Julio. My situation was a little bit different with my heart transplant. I was the first in the Usher program at Penn. How much different is the evaluation process for an organ that's infected with hepatitis C? Yeah, so so this is this this is a paradigm shift. Historically, um, using using donor organs that come from uh, high risk patients, um, such as with hepatitis or with HIV, these organ HIV these organs weren't used. And so now, um, as we've done more organ transplantation and as we've developed better treatments for these infections. We're now starting to use uh, organs from patients that are infected with, with, with hepatitis. And we're also starting to transplant into patients with HIV. And so a, a lot of this data is, is, still, is still emerging. Um, you know, this is something that people are, are actively thinking about uh, in terms of best practices, um, you know, how these uh, should proceed. Um, so it's a little bit of a moving target. Um, you know, but, but, but certainly you can attest to the fact that we're now using these organs um, and patients are doing quite well with them. Is the procedure to evaluate the heart drastically different? Is it very similar? In, in terms of the, uh, the procurement, it's the same. Okay. Um, it's all of the same functional, anatomic, safety metrics. Um, you know, I look at a heart and for me, it's sort of a binary. I think that this heart is gonna work and do well, or I think that this heart may struggle, which means the patient may struggle and may be unsafe. Uh, and so I have my evaluation process. There's a lot of information transfer with the implanting surgeon. We make the decision together. Um, but in terms of quality assessment, it's identical. Thank you. You're welcome. Steve, you had your hand up, where are you at? Wanted to ask a question? You're on mute. Okay. Oh, okay. Hey, so I'm monitoring the chat. Of course, there's a lot of um, people chiming in here uh, saying what a fabulous job that you've done um, with the presentation. We have some kidney recipients. We have liver and kidney recipients and, of course, transplant 
uh, recip uh, heart transplant recipients um, on the call tonight. Um, you know, one of my mottos that I use is you have one life to live and eight lives to give. Carlo, are you aware of any patients that you've dealt with that actually saved uh, eight people's lives or do you not really know the outcome of all the other organs? I do not know the outcome of the other of the other organs, but the majority of the procurements that I've been to, all of the organs were used. We we do uh, unless the organ is poor quality, we do our best to make sure that someone will benefit from that organ. Uh, again, human organs are one of, if not the most valuable commodity in our society. And so we don't want for them uh, to go to waste. In addition to that, every, every donor not only gives um, the solid organs that we've talked about, but parts of the eye, the skin, bone, many different tissues are used for a variety of indications in medicine. So it's not just those eight, there are actually many people that benefit um, from, from uh, organ donation and tissue donation. Very good point. In fact, um, in our July meeting, we will have Dr. Levin from the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania talking about uh, VCA or vascularized composite aloe transplantation. So um, are you aware of any of your patients donating anything like arms or... Um, We've heard face transplants, they do placentas now, there's all kinds of things, right, that Penn's working on. So I, I, have, I have two interesting stories. Um, probably five or six years ago, I went on a local procurement uh, for a heart. And again, the heart team is the leader team, controls the circulation. And in the, the pre-op verification process, a physician from Johns Hopkins came up to me, he introduced himself. He told me that uh, he was the uh, director of the plastic surgery program, which is a little unusual. I'd never seen a plastic surgeon at a procurement. And he indicated to me that he was there to do uh, one of the first arm transplants in the country. And so what he asked me to do was um, before arresting the circulation, before putting on the cross clamp, um, if I would put a cannula or a tube into the vessel that provides blood flow to the arm uh, in order to put a pleage solution down the arm to, to arrest the arm tissues and protect the arm. And so he and I worked together. And as it turns out, uh, you know, I, I was involved sort of peripherally in one of the first uh, arm transplants, um, you know, which was sort of a neat thing to just stumble into uh, on, on an organ procurement. And, and so as soon as I took the heart out, he proceeded with starting to dissect out the arm and, and disarticulate the arm for transplant. I took the heart so I didn't get to see the rest of that process. And I don't know how that patient did, um, but that arm was used uh, for, for an arm tra transplant at uh, Johns Hopkins. Wow. Another similar story, um, probably maybe two or three years ago, I was on uh, a procurement in Hershey, uh, Pennsylvania. It was the middle of the night. And um, I landed, I was one of the last surgeons to arrive and a female surgeon came up to me. She introduced herself as um, one of the uh, gynecologic oncologic surgeons at University of Pennsylvania and explained to me that they were requesting to have a period of about uh, a, a two hour extra delay. Um, I asked why and she said, well, we're doing the, the fourth out of five uh, dry run for a uterine transplant. And so the only other center in, in the United States that had done this at this point was Texas. Um, I think the French had done a few uterine transplants at, at this point, um, but she was there to go through the process of practicing how to do a uterine transplant 
um, so that a woman who uh, either had her uterus removed or was born without a uterus could receive a uterus uh, and then in vitro fertilization performed so that she could become a mother. And so again, I was involved uh, in, in that process. I just sort of stumbled into it by arriving at the procurement. Um, but it was you know, sort of another interesting and, and, and special uh, moment just in terms of the development of organ transplantation, how far we've come uh, and the types of, of transplants that we're performing now. Well, I have to, I was curious and that just led into it. Uh, what kind of emotional conflicts come in between the teams? I mean, there you are, you need that heart out and moving. Here somebody says, well, listen, can we wait two hours while I practice something? I mean, and given the different types of people that are engaged in your work, for example, I can't imagine that that very passionate work goes without a lot of emotion. Do you find conflict sometimes uh, in terms of uh, somebody taking too long to make a decision while everybody else is eager to go? This comes up all the time. Ah. This is one of the challenges with organ procurement. Um, frequently it's in the middle of the night, we <laughs> haven't slept, we're a little tired, we're a little testy, it's a high pressure environment. Um, there are delays, you know, people are coming from all over. Um, these, these things come up not infrequently. Um, I have been in situations where, where surgeons from other centers have, have acted out and, and acted inappropriately and been rude. Um, you know, in, in my mind, this is a team effort. We are all there um, for the same reason, so that we can do right by our patients. Uh, you know, I always try and set a standard of amicability, um, you know, communicate well, get on the same page. Um, my personal belief is that if the donor is stable enough for a delay, um, then, then there should be a delay because it's for a good reason so that um, the organ can be evaluated and can end up, you know, in, in the right recipient. The only time I'll push back is if the donor is becoming unstable. Because again, if a donor becomes unstable to the point where all of the organs are lost um, because we're waiting for a decision on one organ, that transaction is just not worth it. Um, at that point, we need to proceed. We need to salvage as much as we can. Maybe one organ won't end up being used, um, but it won't be at the loss of the remaining organs. Um, I got to ask the other question. In that situation, you've got two, three, four teams there of all different statutes and hierarchies. Who gets to mitigate those kind of conflicts? So the the gift of life team that's there is involved in all of the discussions. Again, who, the heart team, whoever is procuring the heart, is controlling the circulation, the blood pressure, the blood flows really they are responsible for protecting everyone's organs. And so the hierarchy, uh, it, the heart team is at the top and, and really sort of, you know, is, is given more leeway on, on making decisions, taking actions, moving forward. Um, but, you know, ultimately, again, we're all on the same team. Um, you know, we, we, we should all try and make these decisions uh, together and and usually that is the case but but you're right you know I, i've been on procurements when i was fairly junior and there were very senior people and i was the heart team and so i was running the body um and you know in those situations i think you have to stand up for yourself you have to do the right thing you have to act professionally you have to communicate um but but ultimately the decision has to be made that's in the best interest of all of the recipients of the organ I must admit, I forgot about the dimension of tiredness in the middle of the night that would play into that. Thank you. Very. Yeah, that certainly comes answer. into Thanks. play, <laughs> especially if you've been on a run where, you know, in the last eight or nine days, you've done five or six transplants because that's when the organs came. It, um, you know, sometimes they, they come in bunches and uh, it's, it's go, 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 because the organs are available. They're high quality. Let's get them in. And you're all well, good. Melissa Coleman has patiently been uh, waiting. Melissa. Uh, yeah. Oh, 
Hi, I just wanted to say thank you so very much. It's uh, that was a brilliant presentation, and um, I actually um, I'll be 13 years out with my kidney recipient, and um, but what I and I also work for Tower Health, so I work for doctors Guy, Reich, and Zhao. Um, but what you really um, presented was the reverence in which you um, treat that donor with so much respect in all of the teams. Um, I've I've always known about the moment of silence, but until you really mentioned it. The reading about the donor really struck me um, as something that it, it's just so important. So thank you so much for what you do and um, and for helping us all get these great gifts of life. So thank you so very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Melissa. I, I agree. The moment of silence is profound. And, you know, every time I go on a procurement, I anticipate that moment. And and it's it's striking. You know, I've, I've been in that situation almost 70 times. And it's always exactly the same, and and it really should be. Um, you know, we've collected from from all over the country with with the purpose of of you know helping people uh, again all over the country um, at the expense of of someone else's life. And you know, to hear about the donor through the family's words, where they're from, who they are, what they did, you know, how they interacted, their personality. Um, you know, it's it, it can be a little a little overwhelming. It can be a little bit uh, emotional, um, and then the moment passes, and it's time to go to work because mm -hmm. there are sick people that need our help, and uh, we move forward with the procurement. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, listen, we've come to uh, our time limit, and uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, for your questions and uh, your attention. And again, Carlo, just an excellent presentation. We thank you for um, certainly talking about this topic that's really not been discussed much that I'm aware of. So this will become part of our uh, TRIO National Library uh, for other patients and people to view. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Bill, thank you. All righty. Uh, look forward to our next monthly meeting um, in May. Again, Penn will be talking about uh, the summer and pre-cancer, uh, you know, what to look out for when we're enjoying the sun. So join us next month. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening.